Hello everyone, I'm Ken Tate, Director of Engagement and External Relations for the Department of Computer Science. It is my honor to welcome all of our new Strategic Advisory Board members and also to welcome any delegates who are attending this year's meeting in place of uh, other members and also to welcome any of our existing members who simply want a refresher. Uh, the intent of this orientation presentation is simply to bring everybody up to a, a baseline understanding of the university and also the department so that our discussions uh, in the face-to-face -face meeting are more productive. So with that in mind, I am going to start at the highest level at the university level. For those of you who may not be familiar, NC State University is a part of the UNC system and we are the largest university in that system with 35,500 students. We are the flagship science and technology uh, institute as part of the UNC system. Um, we're also a tier one research institute and in 2018 uh, we were awarded uh, $334 million in new research awards. It makes us one of the most productive research universities in the U.S. Our chancellor, Dr. Randy Woodson, a fantastic chancellor, and I've, I've been a part of, uh, of many administrations. Uh, he is absolutely the best chancellor I think NC State has ever had. Uh, his focus is very much on creating value and innovation. Um, so he's put a lot of, of focus and attention in the entrepreneurship program um, and also into our research endeavors. And it has been very successful. We have well over a thousand U.S. patents that either have been awarded or, or pending status, uh, more than 1,500 globally. Uh, we've launched well over a hundred startups uh, and that number is growing significantly uh, every single year. And of course, NC State is credited with producing a tremendous number of consumer products um, that are used every day, uh, well over 270 now that we know of. Uh, we rank number six in the United States in terms of research commercialization. Uh, number two, if you look at just schools that do not have medical schools. And one of the distinctions we are very proud of is that NC State is one of only two universities in the nation uh, to have an NSF engineering research center and one of only three to ever house three of these ERCs over time. Uh, Money Magazine has ranked us for two years in a row the number one best college for your money in the state of North Carolina. But what about the Department of Computer Science? Let's talk about them a little bit. Um, we're part of the College of Engineering and it makes our degree somewhat unique when you compare to the degree of computer science at other schools. Uh, we weren't always part of the College of Engineering. We started out in uh, the College of PAMS, which was Physical and Mathematical Sciences, and over the years that has now become the College of Sciences. But we made the transition into engineering in the late uh, 1980s. Um, and what it really does for our students is it provides them not only a degree in computer science, but an engineering degree with the fundamental foundations uh, there for problem solving and uh, companies. And I think if you uh, have had any uh, experience in dealing with our graduates, you can attest to this. Certainly if you talk to your university relations and your hiring managers, they will tell you that our students are extremely productive. The think and do mentality that exists at NC State is real. Uh, it is a part of our DNA and is very much reflection of the fact that uh, our degree is application driven, hands on, and in our case in the College of Engineering, very much focused on problem solving. So we're very proud of the fact that we are part of the College of Engineering. We're one of the nation's oldest and largest departments of computer science. Uh, as part of the Tier 1 Research Institute, we create a tremendous amount of this research that we talked about at the university level. Um, almost $17 million awarded last year, and we currently have over $60 million uh, currently in, in process. Uh, our expertise ranges from artificial intelligence, serious games, games with a purpose, also commercial games, games for fun, um, networking, security, software engineering, and systems. But one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is the focus on building really strong 
students with soft skills, uh, leadership, communication, and collaborative skills. Uh, we have over 13 research centers, uh, more than 35 labs in different groups. And one thing we're extremely proud of is our early career award winners. These are awards that are given out by the NSF to promising, aspiring young faculty. And with 29 of our faculty having won these over time and 21 currently on our faculty, it is one of the highest percentages that we know of anywhere in the nation. Some points of pride that we want to point out to you because at the end of the day, one of the roles of our ambassadors is to, or our uh, strategic advisory board members is to serve as ambassadors for the department. Um, so we want you to know that we've been recognized by the NSA uh, as a center of academic excellence in information assurance research. At first we were uh, uh, an academic excellence uh, center in education, but we bumped that up to, to research and it is something to be very proud of. It's a very small group of uh, departments and universities that are a part of this. Uh, this past year we were named as the very first university in North America to establish uh, uh, quantum computing as part of the IBM Q Hub. Uh, that is going to give our faculty and our students access to a quantum computer that is growing in size every day. Uh, so that is a phenomenal opportunity for our students. We've been uh, 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 cited as a top 25 game development uh, company by the Princeton Review. Uh, our online graduate degree consistently ranks in the top 10 uh, by a number of different ranking sources. Um, if you've ever owned a flat screen plasma TV, you can thank Dr. Don Bitzer. He's a distinguished university research professor with us, and he's the co-inventor of that flat plasma display, and he actually won an Emmy. And until um, Derek Wittenberg won an Emmy recently for a documentary that he did on the 1983 championship team, but until that time, Dr. Bitzer was the only uh, employee at NC State University and still the only faculty member who has won an Emmy. We have an award-winning senior design center. That's the capstone project that all of our undergraduates are required to take. Uh, it is noted as one of the very best on campus and, and a model that is uh, used across the nation. We are certified. That is, uh, that's table stakes and a quality degree. But I think the thing that's special about uh, our certification is that we've gone through two cycles. We go through these about every six years and we've had no significant findings. Uh, that cannot be said for most departments uh, in our college. So we're very, very proud of that. We are this is a little known fact, the number one supplier of new grad talent to IBM, SAS, Red Hat, Cisco, and NetApp, and probably some other companies, but these are the ones that we know of, and that is pretty much year in and year out, we're the top supplier of new grad talent. And the last thing that we're extremely proud of is that we rank number one in tenure track female faculty among computer science departments in colleges of engineering, and we have a picture here this is absolutely not all of our female faculty. It was uh, the largest group that we could put together. Uh, but I can tell you that in, uh, in less than a couple of weeks, we have plans to, um, to, to shoot a new picture with all of our faculty uh, wearing pink shirts, celebrating the fact that we rank number one. And we continue, this was a couple of years ago, we continue to be ranked number one. So very proud of that. Our department leadership, uh, Dr. Greg Rothamel, joined us in November of 2018. And you can see that uh, Dr. George Ruskus is our Director of Graduate Programs, Dr. Sarah Heckman, uh, Director of Undergraduate Programs. You will be hearing from them uh, during the face-to-face -face meeting this year. Dr. Rudra Duda is our Interim Associate Department Head. Uh, Dr. Jasmine Adams, our Director of Undergraduate Advising. Margaret Hiles, the Director of the Senior Design Center. Leslie Rand Pickett's the director of our graduate career services, which I'll talk about in a minute, and uh, you already already met me. So let's do talk about this uh, corporate and career services suite. It is something that is unique. Uh, I really know of no other department on campus that has anything like this. This all started from premium tuition that we started to collect about five years ago. Um, as new degrees are created at NC State, 
many of them are very much, I would call them boutique degrees, but they're specialized and very high tech in nature and they have tremendous value in the market. And so they were allowed to, to have a, a tuition um, uh, that was a little bit higher than the normal tuition that we charge for master's students. But when we started looking at the value of the master's degree within computer science and the fact that our students are averaging well over $100,000 average salary, starting salaries, uh, we could make a case that uh, our degrees certainly provide that kind of value and justify the premium tuition. So once it was approved by the Board of Governors, uh, the, the, the stipulation was that we had to use all of that money collected to provide benefits and services back to our uh, grad students, which we, we certainly wanted to do. Um, and one of those services was the creation of a specialized space. So right within EB2, we have a suite that has two very high-tech interview rooms. Um, we have the ability to host remote interviews from anywhere in the world. Leslie is a 10-year plus employee with the University Career Center. So she brings tremendous knowledge and experience into this role. And keep in mind that she is servicing uh, well over um, 700, uh, almost 800 students. So she has to know how to scale up uh, her services for uh, resume reviews and interview skills. And in many cases, uh, she reaches out and, and utilizes our corporate partners to do this. But Again, if you have a chance, stop down in 1222 EB2 and take a look at that while you're on campus. Some departmental stats that I would like to share with you. Uh, because of our size, we pretty consistently, consistently rank in the top 10 in terms of degrees awarded, so we produce a lot of talent. In fact, I think over the last few years, we will average somewhere between 400 and 450 graduates per year. Uh, so we're churning a lot of talent out into the marketplace, and that makes the Research Triangle Park um, a strong draw of companies that continue to come here for this talent. Uh, we're in the top 10 in terms of research expenditures, um, top 5 in high-performance computing research, number 6 in software uh, engineering research, and number 18 in systems research. Um, these numbers, I think, have not been updated. I want to say that we're about 50 faculty uh, nine emeritus members and uh, a number of teaching professors and that's something that I need to, to talk about just briefly. I guess it was around 10 years ago that we made a decision to relieve the, uh, uh, the research faculty from some of the teaching responsibilities so that they could really focus on research and we went out and hired our first PhD teaching professors. This has been a tremendous success and we've continued to uh, hire these and it is something that has really caught on across all campuses now and you see more and more uh, programs like ours that are bringing in teaching professors that really have little to no uh, research responsibilities and really to help their, their research focus um, and also gives you really quality, high energy, passionate teachers in the classroom. So win-win there. You can see our numbers, uh, the fall 2018 enrollment was a, a record number uh, of 1,130 undergraduates um, and then about 527 masters and almost 200 PhD students giving us a, a record enrollment of almost 1,900 students. In fact, I think going into the um, fall of 2019 class will be well over 1,900 students and you can see the breakup there. Uh, average salaries continue to go up. Uh, the most re recent data we have shows the average salaries for our bachelor students at over 72,000 and master students 110. Now I'll say that uh, if you're going to the West Coast, uh, a lot of our master students do and, and many of our bachelor students do. The salaries are obviously much, much higher for the West Coast and anyone who goes to the New York area, we've seen salaries that uh, have been in the 140 uh, range with $70,000 signing bonuses. Uh, signing bonuses is quite um, common now, especially for master's students. So uh, it is making those numbers go up. 
In terms of enrollment trends, I'd just like to show this. Uh, if you look at the undergraduate enrollment, we peaked in uh, 2001, the year that I started uh, with the department, and uh, we went through a, um, a dip there, which was very much economy driven. Uh, we bottomed out, uh, you know, around that 2007, 2008, and then we've kind of uh, uh, grown ever since to to the record numbers. Uh, interestingly enough, if you look over the history of the, the, our existence for 50 years, we have seen waves, these ebbs and flows, if you will, of undergraduate enrollment. Uh, every time there is a technology breakthrough, uh, we see a spike in enrollment, and every time there's a market correction of some sort, we see uh, a decrease in enrollment. Um, but contrary to that, if you look at our graduate enrollments since the uh, mid well, excuse me, the late 1990s, uh, we have consistently grown from 176 to 726 uh, in, in the 2018-19 class. So that has continued to rise, but we are at a point now where we're, we've slowed down our graduate growth, and really, um, unless you hire more faculty to be advisors, um, it's, it's really, really difficult to grow it much larger than we are right now. So that's where we stand. How about our freshman profile for the incoming class? We try to show this every single year, just uh, apples to apples comparison. Uh, these are students who were accepted. These will not necessarily be all the students that will show up uh, in, in August. Um, but we did have 695 acceptances. That is uh, down slightly this year from last year. Um, I don't, don't, don't have any reason uh, for that, I, I think more than anything, it's throttled by the College of Engineering and how many people they accept. Um, but that's still a, a, a huge number. Uh, the average GPAs and SAT scores continue to go up. Um, the average GPA now at 4.37, the average SAT of well over 1,400 is uh, significantly higher than our class, say, just nine years ago. The number of females accepted into this class was relatively flat at 162, uh, but that is over 23% of the total accepted number. When you compare that to the fact that 19% of our undergraduate enrollment right now is females, it's good to see a number of accepted females to be above that. Uh, we're certainly uh, competing with a lot of schools for a, uh, a limited pool of female candidates. When we look at the breakup uh, of the entire class, we'll see that there are 84 international students, which make up about 12%. There are 163 students from the United States, but not from North Carolina. That's 23%, and then 448 from the state of North Carolina, which are 64%. And I, and I bring this up because at the university level, because we are a part of the UNC system, we are required by law to take no more than 82 uh, percent, excuse me, more than 18 percent from outside of the state of North Carolina. So 82 percent of the, um, the incoming class in our undergraduate program at NC State must be from the state of North Carolina, minimum of 82 percent. But because this is managed at the university level, and possibly, we haven't got anybody to confirm this, but uh, possibly at the college levels. Uh, when you get down into smaller programs, uh, we are not held to that. And so you can see that a very high percentage, over 34, 35% of our um, accepted class is from out of the state of North Carolina. So if our yield was uh, identical for all of those, which it probably will not be, but if it were, we within the Department of Computer Science would end up with a much higher percentage of out-of-state students. And I'm not very worried about uh, U.S. students, not from the state of North Carolina. I'm, I'm very concerned, though, if the number of international students in the undergraduate program uh, were to grow significantly just because uh, it's much, much more difficult for them to to find internships and companies really support our department because of the availability of, of talent. So um, this may become an issue. I'm just bringing it to, to the attention of the board I, uh, right now is something that we want to continue to monitor. Uh, I will point out that we have 
put in place an outreach program designed, uh, very, very much a comprehensive outreach program designed to attract more females and underrepresented um, students into our enrollment. And we're very happy to say that we have increased the, uh, the absolute number of females from 69 in 2008 to 215 this past year. That's uh, well over a 200% increase. And we've seen the number uh, rise from 11% of our undergraduate population were females back then to uh, almost 20% now. So we're nowhere near where we'd like to be, but we are making great strides. And it is because of the collaboration partnerships that we have with uh, different companies through our e-partners program that allows us to do that. I'd like to provide you with a historical timeline just to show you some of the um, uh, the key events that have, that have happened. Um, I'm looking at this chart now and I see that uh, you know some of the, the numbers are, or the, the, the letters are a little skewed. I apologize for that. Uh, I'm not sure why that is happening. Uh, visually, maybe it's not in what you see, but it is in my slideshow preview. We um, launched the department in 1967 under the leadership of Dr. Paul Lewis. And if you look, we've actually had six official department heads in the life of our department. Uh, Paul Lewis, Don Martin, Bob Thunderlick, Alan Tharp, Mladen Volk, and Greg Rothermel. And I will point out that between Mladen Volk and Greg Rothermel, uh, Dr. Lori Williams was our interim department head for about two years and did a fantastic job, uh, certainly worthy of mentioning. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we were established in PAMS, Physical and Mathematical Sciences. We hired our first PhD faculty member in 1969. The first few PhD uh, faculty members are just now retiring. Alan Tharp uh, retired uh, just, I think, a year or two ago, and Bob Fanaro also. They were the first PhD faculty members. We awarded our first Master's in Computer Studies in 1977. Um, and also, under Don Martin, we really started teaching a lot of non-majors the computer science curriculum. This was in the 70s, and computing across campus was, um, well, it was, uh, it was in dire straits. And as uh, one of the, the stories go, um, students would have to wait in line at the computing facility until late into the night, early wee hours of the morning, sometimes to get computing time. And it was so bad that Don Martin uh, floated uh, the story idea to WRAL to give this some publicity. So they showed up with a reporter and a, a camera, and a couple of our female students waiting in line got into an argument, got into a fight that was captured uh, and reported on the news. And the next day, uh, Governor Hunt um, appropriated or arranged to have money appropriated for NC State to have more campus computing. So that was improved significantly under Don Martin. So we, we certainly uh, credit him with that. Uh, we, under Dr. Bob Thunderlick, we had our first accreditation, uh, 1986. We made that move over into the College of Engineering. Uh, this is significant, and this is, uh, again, a, a little bit of history for you. In the UNC system in the uh, 70s and 80s, only one institute could have a Ph.D. program in a particular discipline. UNC had a computer science uh, program. We had a computer science program. Really, the only two schools in the UNC system that had that at that time. Uh, but because our College of Engineering had PhD program that UNC did not, there was a strategic move to move computer science into the College of Engineering so that we could have PhDs in computer science. Now, I'm, I'm paraphrasing and summarizing this, but this was one of the big reasons behind this move. It was very much strategic uh, to protect NC State's ability to have um, a flourishing graduate program in computer science. So when that happened, uh, we awarded our first uh, PhD programs in the 80s and uh, never looked back. Also significant in that we hired Don Bitzer in 1989. Uh, Bob Funderlook used to tell the story that he uh, recruited Don's wife much harder than he recruited Don himself to get him here. Um, 
under Alan Tharp, we had a period of tremendous expansion and growth uh, for about 10, 11 years. Um, we got a little small picture there of, of some of the faculty that were hired. There were four outstanding faculty. We've hired a lot of faculty and a lot of outstanding ones over the years. Uh, but this particular four, um, Michael Young, Chris Healy, uh, Annie Anton, and Peter Werman, um, they have just gone on to do incredible things. And uh, we're very, very proud of them and attribute that, that hiring class to Alan Tharp while he was here. Alan also is the brain behind the ePartners program. Many of you know me as the face of the ePartners program, but he came up with a concept of a corporate partners program in the year 2000. I came in 2001 uh, to really uh, put it together and, 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 and launch it uh, into what it is today. We became that NSA Center of Excellence uh, late in Dr. Tharp's um, tenure here, and then he turned the reins over to Dr. Mlad and Voke. We made the move over to Centennial Campus into uh, EB2 in 2006. Um, we've achieved record research levels since then. Uh, we've had the graduate program enhancements, creating multiple tracks and the premium tuition that I spoke with. We launched the Fidelity Investment Leadership in uh, Technology Executive Speaker Series back in 2006 when we celebrated our 40th year. And we created a game development concentration in 2008. And now what does the future hold under Dr. Rothamel? Uh, well, the future only knows, but uh, one thing that we can say right now is that we've got record enrollment uh, right out of the chute. And also uh, under Dr. Rothamel's uh, guidance, we have just launched a couple of new undergraduate tracks, one in security and one in entrepreneurism that we're very proud about. So that's a little bit about the history. Uh, there's certainly more that you can go online and read about, uh, but I uh, just want to share that with you. I mentioned that we are in EB2. We have been since 2006. If you look at EB2, you will see that there is a breezeway in the middle of the building, and then there's a huge conference room. We typically use the large conference room facing the uh, Oval uh, for our meetings. Not always, but uh, most of the time we will this year. Um, this building was actually planned to be two buildings, um, but it became one when they added the conference center, and then the, the breezeway that's there was named in the honor of former Dean um, Nino Mazzineri. So it is pretty much considered the ceremonial gateway for the uh, Centennial Campus into the College of Engineering. And with the construction of the, um, uh, the new facility, we will not be calling it EB4, it's the um, uh, Fitz uh, Woodard Building. Uh, we will be moving all of the engineering disciplines with the exception of nuclear engineering into uh, Centennial Campus, and that'll happen sometime next year. So we're very, very proud of this building. Not so proud that it's called Engineering Building 2. If you look closely at that picture right above the breezeway, you will see that there is a, a long white um, cement uh, uh, space, a strip, and that is specifically to uh, house the name of this building. Uh, so we have Engineering Buildings 1, 2, and 3, which uh, I jokingly say were named that to guilt uh, uh, very wealthy uh, alum into giving enough money to, to name this building. I'm not sure what the current naming um, price is for this. I want to say it's around $10 million. Uh, but if you or someone that you know has an extra $10 million and you'd like to have a building named after you, give me a call. We can make it happen. We'll talk a little bit about our ePartners program. Like I said, I was brought in in 2001 uh, to, to manage this program. It is the platform foundation corporate partnership program for the Department of Computer Science. Uh, it is widely viewed as one of the most successful corporate partner programs in the country. I get calls all the time from other universities who have spoken with uh, many of our corporate partners who who say such great things about this program and how it's structured and how they wish other schools would do it. And so uh, they call me and say, hey, what did you do? How do you do it? How do you manage it? Um, and we're very glad to give them that information. You look at our Supri partners. These are the companies that uh, many of you represent. Uh, these are the companies that provide us the uh, 
The donations of a minimum of 25000 and unrestricted support each year, but many of the companies uh, on this uh, page here provide much, much more because they're more actively and deeply involved in our research and faculty support. Uh, of course, you see uh, uh, a lot of names that you are very familiar with. Um, when you look at our ePartner companies, there are about 40 plus of these. Um, you will see everything from small startups uh, to very well-known large companies like Google and Microsoft. Um, this is the, the lifeblood of the program. Um, and we're very, very thankful for all of the support that we get from all of our e-partners and super e-partners. And you may ask, well, what, what, what do we do with the funding that is generated from this program? Um, it helps us provide new programs, um, faculty startup and recruitment support. Uh, it allows us to, to make innovations within our curriculum to help us launch things like um, the new undergraduate tracks, uh, the graduate tracks that we've also launched. Uh, provides instructional technology in the classroom. It allows us to, um, to increase the technology that we have in our seminar room so that we're able to broadcast in and out, uh, record sessions. Um, it allows us to, to host major departmental events like our 50th year celebration that we had recently. It provides for excuse me, travel and development, not just for staff, but also for students, it allows us to send students. In fact, this, uh, is it June? I, sometime early in the summer, we are sending uh, an undergraduate who was involved in undergraduate research to present a paper in Europe. We would not be able to do that if it were not for unrestricted funds. Uh, it also supports our outreach in, initiatives and, and, and allows us to, to have programs like our student ambassadors program and to bring uh, youngsters in from K through 12 throughout the year. Um, it certainly helps with student recruitment, not only undergraduate, but also at the graduate level as we um, specifically try to recruit at events like TAPIA and the Grace Hopper Conference uh, to bring in more U.S.-based PhD students. And again, it provides for facility enhancements uh, down to furniture. Um, and things that just weren't included in the building budget and aren't included in the ongoing maintenance. So unrestricted funding is highly, highly coveted and very, very much appreciated. So we thank you for your ongoing support. I want to talk last a little bit about being an SAB member. What does it mean? Well, so the SAB started as something called the Industrial Advisory Council, and as we always do, we have to create an acronym for that, and it was the IAC. And that was something started by Dr. Alan Tharp. And under Dr. Tharp, he essentially reached out to a handful of individuals that he trusted, uh, and he would take them out to lunch every once in a while. And he and maybe four to five uh, people would sit down and talk about some of the things that uh, were troubling him and keeping him awake at night. Uh, and he would ask them what's going on in the industry. And they in turn would uh, provide him uh, some input. And that helped shape the decisions that uh, the department made at that time. When I came in in 2001, he said, you know, I really like this concept, but I want to build it. I want to make it something more formal. And you have some experience with advisory boards at Nortel. And can you help me do that? And so that's when we created um, a governance model. Uh, we created some formality in terms of guidelines and um, really helped um, create term limits and and, and keep fresh ideas um, coming into the board. And we changed the name then at that time uh, from the Industrial Advisory Council to the Strategic Advisory Board in hopes that we would be able to bring in a blend of not only industry leaders, but also academic leaders and maybe leaders from uh, government, which we have done from time to time. So the SAB has, uh, has and continues to serve as one of the most important cornerstones uh, for the department in terms of, uh, of being very focused in um, application and the real world needs of our partners. And so you're here to provide input, 
leadership and guidance to our department leaders. And so in the face-to-face -face session, you will be hearing about changes that are being considered and you'll be asked to share your input and we encourage you, uh, you know, to speak up and tell us how the things we're thinking about are going to be uh, impacted uh, within your market sector, within your line of business. Um, share your vision, share your experience, your, your expertise to the department. Uh, it certainly helps us. But when you leave here, I mentioned before, we want you to serve as ambassadors, as advocates for the department. Help spread the word about what's going on back here. And we, this board does not exist to be a fundraising board. There are other boards on campus where that is their full purpose. The purpose of this board is not that. It is to provide guidance for our strategic direction. However, you are in an influential position. Uh, many of you are representing our Super E partners, and we encourage you to continue to provide um, either yourself or influence the financial support of the department because I think as you continue as SAB members, you will certainly can see how vital that is from being, from taking us from a, a, a good department to a great department. Let's talk a little bit about the contributions. Uh, we have seen many of them over the years that our SAB has made. Uh, there's been a strong focus on soft skills, communication skills, teaming skills, leadership skills, uh, and you've seen that being pushed deeper and deeper into the curriculum because of the insistence of our strategic advisory board members. Uh, you've given us early warning signs about offshoring uh, and the cycle and bringing those jobs back uh, into the U.S. Uh, you've certainly told us about emerging areas and the things that we needed to be aware of. Uh, I remember somebody telling us that our website was uh, in dire need of, uh, of updating. Um, we have brought marketing material and branding material in for, um, for review and input, and uh, especially as it relates to recruiting uh, underrepresented students. And so you've had tremendous input into that. We've asked you to step up and help with the recruitment of, of our faculty and our students. Many of you are involved in uh, a lunchtime activity where we recruit PhD students. Many of you uh, have had the opportunity to be involved on uh, task force, and some of you have been selected to, to be part of our recruitment of department heads over time uh, and the dean. So we really, really appreciate, appreciate that. Um, Keith Collins, one of our emeritus members, uh, and his wife Margie helped launch the Diversity in Computer Science Endowment through a challenge back to all other members of the SAB to, to give a little, give a lot, give what you could. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that during the session of where we stand and where we would like to go. Um, and then we've had a member who really pushed me in the launch of a theater-led communications workshop for our um, ambassadors, and that has been well received. These are just some of the examples of specific contributions that have been made. Uh, just a... A, a glimpse at the terms and who will be expiring. You see uh, those members who finish up their second term. And, and, and as you recall, when you're asked to be a member of the board, you are automatically on for three years. And then it is up to you if you would like to, uh, uh, to continue that for an additional three-year term. So you could be on the board for up to six years. We do have this uh, emeritus member status that uh, is given to those individuals who are just so actively engaged and involved throughout their six years that uh, that we want them and they want to continue on. It is a very selective um, process to be named an emeritus member, but you can see here that Wayne Clark, Keith Collins, Donald Thompson Jr., and Steve Worth are, and many of them will continue to come to the meetings and continue to participate. We also have uh, kind of ex officio members, uh, the chair and the vice chair of our faculty strategy planning committee is part of the, the, the SAB makeup. Um, and I, I don't know that I've mentioned this before, but uh, all of our super E partners have a seat at the table as an SAB member. Many of you are representing these super E partner companies. 
but if you're not representing a super e partner company then you are in what we call an at large seat and those have been uh, dwindling in number over the years just because of the explosive growth in our e partners program some of the priorities that we have set as a board is to expand the board membership and we we continue to try to use those at large seats to look at uh, other types of roles that we can bring in to give us different perspective. Uh, we do use uh, members of this board in focus groups to address certain uh, topics throughout the year. You may have an opportunity to do that uh, in the coming year. Uh, we will formally go through a skills inventory, skills assessment. Uh, that's normally done every uh, three years or so and uh, Steve Worth helps us pull that together and this information is used to help um, us through our accreditation process but also to tweak our curriculum. Um, I mentioned the diversity in computer science endowment. We, we do have a priority to, to grow this to 250,000 uh, and that will allow us to provide um, awards of $2,500 uh, annually to more and more students. Uh, we would like to increase the number of endowed chairs within the department, so we'd like your help either at the corporate level or individual level in finding uh, individuals to help us grow that. Certainly uh, utilize your role as an advocate. Um, if you have a relationship on uh, INCEDA, uh, CED, Board of Trustees, General Assembly, uh, continue to spread the word about what we're doing here in the department. Um, you have an opportunity throughout the year. We'll issue invitations to participate in different events and activities, and we hope that you'll do that. And as I mentioned before, our priority is to, for you to serve as an ambassador and help us to build and sustain a really strong brand image and recognition for the department. Each of you have been uh, added to our Strategic Advisory Member Hub site. Uh, Member Hub is a company that was launched by a computer science alum by the name of Lauren Harrell and uh, Lauren has graciously allowed us to um, to use this site uh, for all of our private communications uh, so from time to time we'll send messages out threaded messages that will allow uh, you to respond back and others can see those responses um, we don't use this site as much because I understand there are firewall issues with some companies. So we'll, we'll continue to use email for, for many of our communications, but just want you to be aware of this. Um, I would normally open it up for Q&A at this time, but that is impossible given that you are uh, watching this or listening to this on your own. But if you do have questions, I invite you to bring them to the meeting itself and let me know early on. And then uh, just as contact information, uh, here is mine. Um, again, you probably have all of this, but I provide it for you just in case. I appreciate you taking this time to, um, uh, to, to listen to me for so long, rambling. But, uh, but I do hope that this will make us much more productive as we go into our face-to-face -face session uh, this year. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you uh, shortly.